Hey neighbors, the handyman here with Initiative Coffee Company along with the serpent of Rama himself, Jake Del Maro. Today, we're going over DDEX 2-2, Embers of Elmwood, writer Daniel Hemlick, editors Claire Hoffman, Chris Tulatch, and Travis Woodall. This is a four-hour adventure set for five second-level characters. It highlights the cult of Eternal Flame. It starts as a rescue mission, turns into a home invasion, and finishes with an investigation, and pulls the focus away from the Saja state and explores the power structures of Mole Master. Adventure background. The content here is hugely beneficial to frame out the season for DMs, but doesn't really offer anything actionable for players. DMs should really put time into understanding the power dynamics in Mole Master. House Colkin is a majority stakeholder in Elmwood and acts as a protector at Noble House. Adventure hooks. If your players have played 2-1, you could utilize the work they did for Saj as a way to explain Zora Rosalind Colkin's desire to hire. Other adventure hooks you could look into are uh, Entry to the Cloaks, the Lord's Alliance, the Yamal Enclave, or Fresh Adventurers to Mole Master with no political affiliation. So Jake, when we look at the adventure background, obviously some of this stuff is pertinent and important to the story. The devastation orbs are huge. Um, the cults are, are infiltrating Mole Master. But ultimately, what is the information that DM should be taking away from this section to guide at least this module, if not the rest of the season? First and foremost, um, it starts out with Mole Master. Just saying a quick blurb. If you've never run an adventure, you didn't run 2-1, this is telling you Mole Master. This is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You, It's not a fun place to be if you're not in, of affluent nature. Like It's just not an amazing place. You don't find yourself here in a dark night or you know at 2 in the morning. Um, as for what how it actually includes in the adventure, Elmwood, that's a huge aspect. There's many adventures written not necessarily in the AL canon play, but Elmwood itself, um, it is protected by and as a majority stakeholder or is held by the the Colkins, the House Colkins. That is an important thing for them. That's a drive. Um, it explains why Zora Rosalind Col Colkin, Colkin is. Um, it explains why Zora Rosalind Colkin is so intrigued and in wanting to get knowledge. Mm -hmm. It can play in how she is, um, how you play her as a, as a DM. Um, additionally, mention of the, of the Devastation Orbs. This is the first major mention. This, you're jumping right out of the gate um, from going from 2-1, if you did, did this with the group, or if you didn't, there's been no mention of a Devastation Orb. You don't see this until actually way later hmm. on, or even in the books. Um, these things are mini nukes. These things can blow up large parts of cities. Mm -hmm. um, very relevant. In this case, um, this Devastation Orb was a prototype for Elmwood. It was, it's it's it blew up Elmwood, and it's something that is important, and it once again feeds back into why uh, Zora is so interested in knowing more. Sure. Um, I think focusing on that devastation orb issue also it also shows the volatility of the de devastation orbs and the yep. risks these cults are willing to go through, right? Like this devastation orb was not intended to blow up in Elmwood; it was intended to get to Mole Master, and just happened to explode in Elmwood. So those aspects of showing how much risk these cults are willing to take uh, does a lot to highlight the major antagonists of the season here. I agree. <clears throat> One more quick note about adventure backgrounds here. Um, there is a portion of this that kind of goes left field. Um, City Watch, Corrupt City Watch, the Hawks. This part is not highlighted until the very end of the adventure, but you should not be thrown off as a DM when you see this information. Sark Tolliver, who is he? He's a hawk has no mention until really the last page but it does give you as a dm the ability to not go oh what the heck like it's something it's important to read and actually starting out the series really the adventure backgrounds are worth a read and if you find information you already have oh no it you reinforce the information you already knew or you learn something new and you can expect it you can have a little bit more of the dm world knowledge hmm. that you can give to your players and don't feel like you have to go oh please wait a minute i need to read this you already know it so that is something i would definitely highlight it also gives you the opportunity to just be ready right like those player questions that are like what's a hawk right like yeah if you know that going in it's really helpful yeah. and it makes you seem like a more competent dm when you know going off the bat, like <laughs> a hawk is the secret police of Mole Master versus yeah. like, I don't know, I'll look it up. You know, like obviously you're not going to have all the answers that your players come up with. Um, 
but this is this is one that like if you put a little research into uh, you can track down the information that's valuable absolutely <clears throat> part one breaking the law the adventure begins in the early evening after the group has received an invitation from Zora Rosaline Culkin the group has been invited to the Traveler's Cloak Inn the Traveler's Cloak Inn puts the vast inequality of Molemaster on display this will come up regularly throughout Adventures League, not just in Season 2, but CCCs, as well as the season-agnostic epic DDEP 0-1, The Red War. The Traveler's Cloak. Use the box text to explore just how extravagant the Traveler's Cloak Inn is. Offer special menus featuring the character's favorites. This allows the players to explore aspects that get overlooked, allowing for a more complete view of their characters. Zora. While this is all happening, you can play up the details for Zora Culkin. She's the head of a noble house. She's stepped away from the cloaks to lead her family. She's capable in combat. She's determined to find out what happened in Elmwood because business, justice, vengeance, largely that's going to be up to you. She gives a background about Elmwood seen in bullet points. Lean on these bullets as framing anchors for the module. If you're running this for the first time, a hundredth time, or cold, these lists are going to tell you the major relevant points. Elmwood. Elmwood was reduced to ash and cinder without magical or physical signs of what caused the immense destruction. A single woman drifted into Molemaster Bay on a makeshift raft of items clearly from Elmwood. She's at a hospice operated by the priests of Ilmater now, but not well enough to communicate. The Hawks are on their way to take her into custody. Pointers. Colkin gives a couple of pointers about what might happen. The guards could potentially be bribed, but not likely. The priests could be utilized as friends. But ultimately, she'd prefer not to have any deaths occur if avoidable. She wants the target brought back discreetly. Time is of the essence, though, so find ways to ratchet up tension as your party takes on the task. You could set a timer for 15 minutes, and if the group can't put together a plan by then, Colkin may never know what happened at Elmwood. Jake, when we look at part one and breaking the law, there's a lot of aspects here that are brought into the story that mm -hmm. aren't necessarily fleshed out in 2-1. Uh, mm -hmm. One of those being the Hawks. Um, I think they're briefly mentioned in one of the mods, uh, in the, the Cult of Air mod, but there isn't really a, descript a discussion of like how um, integrated the Hawks are in the Mole Master Society. We're really looking at like a, a secret police or, um, you know, the, the cultural police, whatever, you know, whatever nation, authoritarian nation you yeah. want to think of in terms of these... Of this task force yeah so i mean following up on that very interestingly enough they have almost three separate police forces in mole master they have the city watch who are the people that can be corrupted hmm. you have the soldiery who are mentioned in 2-1 that are kind of like the people that get stuff done they're the hmm. ones that are setting up the the police tape they're the ones doing the doing the proper and proper filling out the right documents kind of thing. They're doing their job. Less corruptible, still possible. And you finally have the Hawks, which are actually a subsection of the soldiery mm -hmm. that they can be dressed as the soldiery, but technically they're still the Hawks. Mm -hmm. um, they make people disappear. Like, yeah. that's that's just how it is. And uh, Colkin elab elab elaborates on that. Uh, Tolkien does elaborate on that, where people go missing. It's not uncommon. If things are not meant to be, they're not meant to be. If you're not supposed to be there, you're not going to be there. And uh, she has a very... Uh, she's earned a lot of respect for them. I think that is, a, that is an important point to make, and you shouldn't mess with them if you don't need to. Um, well, she's a noble, right? Like, you, yeah. you don't become a noble in this environment by not respecting, <clears throat> like, the authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. um, you become a noble by finding ways to manipulate those regimes to benefit mm -hmm. you rather than um, other people. Absolutely. So, um, other than the secret police, uh, Zor Zora Culkin, um, it's important to note that Zora is a title. Zora and Zora is a title. Uh, if it gets confusing, it's not a, it's not her first name. Um, Zora and Zora is... I don't know if... It's not clear if it's a title in Mole Master or if it's a title of like the controlling arm of Elmwood. Um, I guess it doesn't necessarily matter, uh, but that's something DMs could make a choice on and just kind of kind of go with from there. Um, Elmwood, uh, just to like frame it out in, in terms of like geographically, it's about two hours away. 
Um, I think it's pretty nondescript as to two hours in what direction, but I think there have been maps that have been published okay. since yeah. that put El Elmwood on the map. Um, so you can kind of check on that. The, the Traveler's Cloak is like, it's the height of luxury, right? So um, play up that. It's, it specifically mentions that rooms are 12 gold a night. Um, so we're looking at access to uh, an establishment that you know, common people are not going to have access to, right? You know, this, this is this is almost like one of those things that you can use for Culkin to impress your party members where 12 gold a night, like your party members might not have 12 gold, right? They're really being invited into kind of a special place um, just to have this conversation with her. Uh, and she's covering their food, um, whatever extravagant meals they want to have, like really play up those aspects of your character and don't skip out on the opportunity to ask your characters what they want to eat and what their favorites are because it's going to really um, underline their own characters in their heads right I think there's a lot of folks who are in AL who are, look at their characters as a system of like mechanics and rule sets on a piece of paper and really get away from the the narrative components of their characters in this in this in the the organized play system um mm. and I, so i think like for, at least for our library games and our, our youth programming like we're working on developing kind of a uh, a living document list of things to ask people about their characters um for the sake of growing depth in those characters right whether it's favorite food um what they're wearing i know there's been a couple of publications on dm's guild about like character tattoos and character wardrobe and hairstyles um, and they can seem frivolous at times but ultimately what it's doing is it's outlining in your players minds what their characters are looking like and I think that's a valuable thing to do to keep them engaged in the story mm -hmm. um, to, to even not too much to jump off of that but um, it's just it also shows, as you had mentioned, like the lavishness of the ta Traveler's Coke in, but being like, it's not garbage food. Like, mm -hmm. being like, oh, I want, my favorite food is my mom's cabbage soup. I don't know why cabbage soup, but you know that is, and right. they make a cabbage soup very similar to your mother's. Sure. And like, it just, it adds that. And mm -hmm. it, it just, I agree 100% with Brian on this. It's, you're making it, you're making the players make a decision. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't build my characters necessarily saying, Ooh, I wonder what kind of what kind of tomatoes they like. Like it, but you know what? Maybe like sun dried tomatoes now. Yeah. You know, it, it adds the it adds the value. Um, not only it's a it's a small ad. Mm -hmm. And I think like those offhanded, seemingly meaningless choices are what make your character meaningful, right? Like mm -hmm. sun dried tomatoes is not a pertinent thing about your character, but it is part of the whole that becomes pertinent, right? Yeah. Um. So I think like doing those little like those little exercises, even like, you know, we give out advantage at the beginning of every session and those little exercises of like, what does your character wear boots, shoes, sandals or no, no shoes at all? Like, does your character wear shorts or pants, uh, jerk in her vest? Like, uh, does it have tattoos? Does it have long hair, or short hair? Like those physical descriptions are step one. And yeah. then you get into things like, what did your character's parents do for a living? Were they farmers? Were they miners? Were they um, carpenters? What did they do? Um, what is your character's favorite food? What is uh, your character's first memory, favorite color, whatever? And those yeah. are the aspects that are going to get your players to engage with their characters in ways they don't realize are important when they do it until after the fact. House of Suffering. Use the box text to frame out the hospice. If your players are interested in knowing more about Ilmater, have them do a low DC religion check of an 8 to a 10 to find out he's the deity of martyrdom and suffering and his followers work in ways to take the grieving, pain, and loss of others upon themselves. With regard to the building, you can fill in descriptions with information from the building section and general features. Guards, plan, and priests. There are four guards here, two at the entrance and two at the target's bed. The first two pay you no heed, the other two are just there to keep watch. One is sleeping, one is playing cards. This in-between area is typically where the players begin discussing potential options, and also enables you to have a priest to walk up and begin a friendly conversation with them. They're willing to let you help as long as you're respectful to them and aim not to harm anyone. Let your party be creative. Medical condition. 
The woman they are looking for is in not much shape to do anything. She's pretty shocked from what happened. She's still covered in a bunch of injuries, burns, has lost an eye. When your players likely ask about the medicine check, inform them that there's a remnant of a curious tattoo that was burned away. An arcana check can later reveal that the tattoo is a modified version of, the Ch of a Chandathan rune for flame. This information is important later on. Escape. They're going to need to get this woman back to the estate, and you should play up the shock of what's happened to her. She repeats fire and ash very quietly to the people carrying her. While the players try to get back to the estate quietly and discreetly as possible, have someone make a perception check and make a note. Play up suspension. Let them know they felt like they were being watched until about the last 200 yards to the estate. So House of Suffering gives the real opportunity for roleplay aspects here, as well as some planning. Um, yep. There's not a lot of modules that give players the opportunity to really plan out um, their approach. Um, uh, there's a mod in season one that we lovingly refer to as the Battle of Fire Crotch that I can't. Uh, Outlaws of the Iron Route, is that what it is? Outlaws of the Iron Route. Yes. Uh, Outlaws of the Iron Route gives this opportunity to like plan out uh, an attack. Um, and this is another situation, though, very, obviously much smaller, where the party can really kind of take the approach they want to take in solving this issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even bouncing off of that. Um, it, it's, I've had a couple, and a couple parties actually, uh, really want to plan even pre reaching the tent or reaching this hospice saying like, I had a table of players at a con. They were like, I want to get some flowers. I want to get some other things and act natural. And it, like, mm -hmm. it kind of came off funny because like, there was no one else doing that in the, in, in the hospice, but it was like the paladin was going like, bless ya. And like, emanate, like, I wasn't making him use resources because he was like, bless you. And he, he was doing like a, um, a healing hands or like right. blanking on it. But like making a show of like, hey, I'm here. And it like became kind of goofy, but at the same time, it worked. They're like, mm -hmm. I'm going to put some flowers on people's beds. Yeah. And it really does, if that's the route that your players are going down, sure, there's a flower shop right next door. Uh, there's, uh, there's a candy shop two doors down. Like, I I think whatever maybe I think it's important especially at this point like at, at, at tier one at level two at level three to reward especially new players for making a choice yeah. right it doesn't necessarily have to be a good choice right but the fact that they're making choices is a step in the right direction to being like successful at this game right yeah um, the more choices they're making like even if they don't seemingly make sense the like just going through that motion and exercising those muscles are going to be a real um strong point toward making successful choices in the future right yeah um tier one is not the place to punish players bad choices um tier two might be right like that might be uh, one of the things that comes up in 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 tier two play five to five to ten eleven to um 16 whatever but at this point especially with new players if they're being engaged in any way that's successful right like that's yeah. a that's a note of success and it can be achieved in multiple ways mm -hmm. um i'm not going to give examples directly but they've got something in their pack they might have mm -hmm. they have something in their background feature they are far travels fa travelers they have a they they're they got a song that they mm -hmm. used to play people that were sick mm -hmm. cool awesome do it yeah. i love it give me performance check you're getting advantage on everything chief like yeah like that's that's just how it's gonna be and um as you said rewarding uh creative play mm -hmm. um i personally and this might not be come across as out to other dms but that's my discussion for it point uh is i prefer role play over combat mm -hmm. um definitely in tier one like i yeah. know we have have the issue of like oh we want to know what our characters do but let's say you don't have a table full of brand new players mm -hmm. that are like let's go to the rose shop or like, mm -hmm. whatever like that but people that are you know have played since the dawn of time right. and they might not be interested in learning that but i'd rather them be willing to shrug combat for more creative play or interesting mm -hmm. interactions to make it i'll say more tough as a dm because I, these are pre-written mods to make me have my dm muscle then be you know worked out a little bit where they cause like hey i want to do this this and this and i'm like uh I don't want to be in that space ever because that to me, it means that I'm struggling as a DM. Um, yeah. And you know, it's funny, like 
I am not as familiar with season two as I am with season one, right? <clears throat> but I think about the season one mods I've run 30 <laughs> times or whatever, you know, yeah. like however many times I've run those mods. And I think about the most like engaging and interesting things for me as a DM are the ones that aren't typical, right? Yeah. Not scripted. Um, not scripted, like players really just like leaning into the the twenty percent of their character sheet that isn't about hitting people or healing people's yeah. damage, right? So much of this game, just by the character sheet alone, such a percentage of this game is focused on combat that when people want to incorporate those other aspects, the background features, wow. the exploration features, those the story rewards. I really like to lean into those because I don't mm -hmm. see them all the time. Like I, I run at cons all the time and it's always like my maximized fighter and this maximized cleric all cast death ward and go, you know, like, but there's not, there's not any uh, reverence paid to that. Those first level choices you make. Yeah. Like I'm a sailor. I'm going to get free travel, right? I'm yeah. a guild artisan. Let me see if there's, um, a blacksmithing guild in town that can give me some information because we're of the same labor union. Yeah. You know, those aspects get overlooked so much at level four, much less at level 17. Yeah. That, like, it closes so many opportunities for gameplay that it's yeah. just exciting to see characters make those choices and, like, uh, lean into those aspects of their character. Yeah. I, I, not to even harp further on it, but it, there, that's just the entrance mm -hmm. to that. I mean, that's, a, we're not even yeah. into like the medical conditions, everything, but like, I will call me a bad DM, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to, if, if I have a veteran player trying just to cheese the system and be like, I've played this mod seven times. And then I have a player who, a new player who I know is new and a kid mm -hmm. who's like, I want to be X, Y, and Z. I'm like, you can be X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And I'm going to focus 100% on that new character and tell the other person, probably in some way, shape, or form, and that might not be DM etiquette, but I'm going to say, hey, you need to let it go. Like, mm -hmm. I know you're trying to get through this mod right now, but, like, I have a new player here, and if you're trying to sabotage my attempts to have someone that's mm -hmm. interested in the hobby, I'm going to yeah. have a problem with that. But that's a once-in-a-million opportunity, a chance. Sure. But, like, to... I'm going to focus 100% on somebody that has never played a mod and never or a brand new player because we're still in that realm. We're not in tier two anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is another topic on tier two level five characters. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say these level two characters or whatever level they are at the time, one, two, three, or four, if somebody's brand new and is giving me time to like be like, hey, I want to do this. And this other guy's like, I'm just going to walk in. I'm going to be like, I'm going to deal with you in a moment. I'm going to give this one kid his time. Mm -hmm or adult I'm yeah not i saying. think you know i think that that's an interesting thing to bring up especially since like in my mind the strongest aspects of the adventures league system are introducing the game to new players yep. right i think anybody realistically pending their schedule could find a homebrew game or a hard book game and sit down with four other people and huck dice right yeah i think the big draw of Adventures League is to get new people who aren't exposed to ways to find that group, who aren't exposed to enough, enough knowledge of the hobby to meaningfully engage in those groups. Yeah. Um, the tools they need to be able to do so, right? Yeah. And there are a lot of other benefits to AL for folks that like don't live near game stores or don't have good internet and can't get online to play or just don't want to play online or don't have a schedule that allows them a regular game time and, and the drop in drop out is good. But if, if, if adventures league is anything, it is an introductory point to the hobby that I think is meaningful to the folks who use it as one. Yeah. Anywho. Um, <laughs> so going on to like the plan, the priests and everything, people mm -hmm. are going to ask what ways out. Um, that's going to be something that is going to be like, Hey, just there's a back door. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a window, this, there's a back door. Yeah, there, whatever it may be. Um, the other part is the guards, they're going to be... The first two don't care. They're kind of there. Get, get, let, let your party be creative of how they're going to dispatch the other two guards. Once again, um, as Brian noted, make let the uh, let the priest be of use. Make uh, Maybe they're going to... 
be a distraction or like they will cause a scene have them make ask for a donation be like yeah. if it's not too much to problem they're not gonna they're not gonna bother you they're the people of suffering they're like hey it would be nice if you're able to donate a little bit yeah. but if not we get it mm -hmm. actually we can give you healing potions if you really want to ransack our ransack our place <laughs> don't give them don't tell the players that they can get healing <laughs> potions but like <laughs> point made medical condition is something i don't think needs to be told too much she's in crud shape that's just what it is yeah she's in bad shape she got a tattoo um i mean i would make note of the tattoo if, if yes. your party uh makes their medical medicine check like it becomes pertinent it becomes as pertinent as you want to make it later yeah. um but other than that like it's funny you know it reminds me of um the 1-3 i think uh like the madman yep the madman in 1-3 yeah <clears throat> And it just seems like, um, it seems like they throw in these NPCs as like plot devices, but don't want to have to deal with the consequences of those NPCs being NPCs. So they're just yep. like, she's non-communicative. She can't talk. Uh, if she know, is. She if was, you heal her, it, fire and ash. That's all you get. <laughs> right. Yeah. She's gone nuts. She's gone crazy. It's not. It was a bad situation for her, and she's still in shock. All right. Yeah. That's fine. Cool. I guess we're um, gonna deal with it then. So she's just a barrel of evidence, more or less, yeah. rather than an NPC. Um, in terms of the escape, yeah, there, there, there are as many exit points as you want to make them. Um, there's a let lot your of party get creative. There's nothing crazy that's gonna happen here. Just, I would definitely emphasize the fact that they're being watched. And once they know, yeah. once they get close, be like, all right, we know where you're at. Like, they're, maybe they're not expressly watched, saying it, but like, but saying, hey, we know where you're at. That's the kind of feel I would be pushing with your with your players. And they're like, oh no, and it's gonna instill paranoia. Mm -hmm. But that's the point. Like, it's yeah. too early in a mod to like start pulling off the rain or pulling off the gas. Right. And I think largely any skill check your players can defend could justifiably be used here. Sure. Um, to get uh, the the survivor out. Um, I mean, some of them are bigger stretch. You know, like Arcana and Nature, like. I'm sure your players could make an argument for. Um, this is another one of those situations where, like, a player is making a choice and trying to defend it. Like, maybe adjust it, the DC by a little bit, but ultimately, like, whatever they go roll is gonna it. whatever. Yeah, like, <laughs> minus like a two, like anything above eight, I would say is like twelve, whatever. Like, they sure. get a plus ten on the check. Fine. Yeah, whatever. Like, I mean, just like it's another situation where like the players are making efforts to like get to know their characters and like exploit the strengths of their characters yeah and the tier one like that's the point of playing tier one so just kind of absolutely part two a house divided Culkin manor use the box text to set the tone and introduce dawson he'll show the party to zora Culkin and see to the elmwood survivor zora Culkin. dawson will take care of the patient and bring your players to Culkin in her study she's lounging due to the late hour the adventurers are free to wander around the house and explore as they wish. If no one wants to speak to Zora, which is not required, she'll retire to her bedroom. She'll have rooms for the rest of the adventurers. The woman will be in the room next to hers. Feel free to add details to the different rooms in the house. Your players may be worried about an ambush after the pr previous perception check when they feel watched. Let them do shifts if they like. Make a roll if they decide to split up to determine the ambush in the next scene. Welcome intruders. Use the box text to set up the coming combats. Patient's room and Ravia's room. If anyone tries to stay behind and protect her, Dawson shows up with two Culkin guards and they tell the players that they'll protect her. If they're hesitant for whatever reason, insight check. Whatever the result, he's telling the truth in a roundabout fashion. Running combat. A big tip for running the next part is deciding at the beginning which three encounters you're going to use. Be familiar with your maps because this is a multi-level and essentially multi-staged encounter. Have your stat blocks ready. I even go as far as to roll initiative for the rooms instead of individual monsters to make it easier. Also, push to have one encounter beaten at a time. When one is about to be finished, the next might be headed their way. Either way, the estate is being set on fire by the intruders. Threats and Culkin. During the encounter, let them know about the increased smoke and need to remove the threats. If they were not on watch and were in their rooms, make mention that no movement has occurred out of Zora's room. This will establish the importance to remove the threats and save Zora. House Fire. 
If things are going extremely smooth for your players, throw in an exhaustion check. Constitution save DC 10 to play up the smoke and lack of oxygen in the house. Your players are not going to be capable of putting the fire out in their current level. Where to now? Next steps. Zora imparts to them that the wagon tracks were below the patient's room and the Lord's Alliance tracked that wagon to the Zent Ghetto. If Zora wasn't rescued, Perry on Ramden from the Lord's Alliance takes on that role instead. Hostages taken? If your group spared an attacker, more information becomes available. Monsters join the fight. They were instructed to take the woman and dump her in a trash bin behind the abandoned temple of Sirak. The old butler was supposed to help, and then they were also supposed to torch the place. All right, Jake. So ultimately here we're looking at three encounters of five? Of twelve? Uh, I believe so. It's... um. I... I think the biggest thing here is I have, in my recent recollection, I do not believe I had any encounters happen on the top floor. If they are, it's like, it, it might be in the lo li line of like, it might be on the line of methods occurring or something along those lines. You got to sure. be very aware of your party's mm -hmm. level yeah. because this, now we're in the wild west of, of Adventures League. You're not going to get necessarily level two people you can end up with yeah. like a table of level fours and mm -hmm. that's a different fight of four cultists or a dug and two mastiffs mm -hmm. compared to what's potential a flame skull highly recommend not putting a flame skull right. in because the sheer temptation of dropping a fireball on a party right somebody fails or if you are going to do that maybe switch the mechanics where yeah. you pass you take no damage yeah. if you fail you take only half damage yeah that's presumably some way drop to... that dc as well exactly yeah um ultimately we're looking at a lot of like a lot of these fights can be pretty challenging you know like mm -hmm. bandits four bandits is tough for a low level party um a thug and two mastiffs is kind of challenging yeah um thugs have a kind of a lot of hit points for level one and two um smoke methods is tough they blind things fire snakes are tough like there's a lot of tough encounters here um, and the real the real solution is to really focus in on what your party is capable of, right? Sure. I think ultimately, by and large, seasonal modules un uh, undertune combat versus the ability of players. Um, but that is yeah. assuming a few things, right? I play predominantly with people who know the game game pretty well. Yeah. Um, I play predominantly with folks who are utilizing resources that have come out since this module came out. They give them a little bit more uh, survivability, a little bit more firepower than yeah. is available in just the PHB. Yeah. Um, and I play with people who want to rush to level five because they hate tier one. You know, um, you might have players in your party who want to stay at level one for a while. I can't imagine why, but like maybe that's something they're interested in, right? Maybe the they've done all of two dash one. And like based off the current rules, like it's their choice to level up or not. So yeah. um, the biggest risk you run into is having to split the difference between two level one characters and two level four characters and coming up with a meaningful challenge. Uh, because things that are going to challenge a level four character are going to destroy a level one character in, in one attack, right? So the other thing is, uh, while you're starting to run these more... Uh, these these encounters that are not are the, running these mods that are not two dash one one dash one three dash one whatever it is, you have to be aware of average party party level. That is something that they utilize heavily in Adventures League. In this case, this is optimized for five level twos. Five level twos is considered their average. Average party means and and you should have three average encounters per the mod stating that. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with it. Sure. It's not in every case because typically what happens when you're having those adjustments is more hit points yeah. uh higher dc on a save but that's like a very strong party this is like three super tough encounters mm -hmm. like having uh a cult uh, fanatic and four uh cultists show up and start stabbing you mm -hmm. and then you have to do two more of equal difficulty yeah. that's that's a lot to ask and i think and the best i guess the point to make is that's for only five level twos Right. I think and that I should think, be almost higher. It should be five level threes. Yeah, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is like party challenge rating is less a product of levels on the table and more a product of numbers, right? So even if, if you have six people playing, 
Mm-hmm. Even if you they're all level two, it's considered an average party versus three level four or three level threes, right? And I look at number seven, the parlor, right? Like yeah. if you have so if the average party level is two and you have six level two characters, that becomes a very strong party very quickly, and the veteran is gonna knock all of your players unconscious. And a thug. A well, and a thug. Three, but like, you have five attacks, yeah. one set with advantage, and each one's doing five to nine damage. And it's not, and they're also, the veteran is like 17 AC. Yeah. So you just gotta be very careful. Mm-hmm. I I err on the side of caution. I softball yeah. some of my, de- my, my stuff, and that's what I'm known for. I softball, but I'm, right. the, as the, I've the said in previous videos. Stare. If I've said in other situations, and the, yeah, yeah, the gold Care Bear stare. I've said that it's, I'd rather err on the side of mm-hmm. letting the party be successful and have a good time. Sure, they're gonna they can steamroll, but like I can always steamroll back. Mm-hmm. It's when the party is no longer capable of doing something, that's when it becomes a a, a problem. Like when I take somebody out of combat and they're go now the fighter who's got three HP is like I need to run. Mm-hmm. Now that opens up the entire combat, and I whoopsied my way into a situation where now I've got a veteran on the field, and he's not going to let up because now you are you are targets. Yeah, and the other thing is like, as a DM, it's all you can, like players always know when you pull punches, right? Mm-hmm. And so I would rather start off weak and ramp up and do a fourth yeah. encounter if I need to. Exactly. Then start off with three hard encounters and all of a sudden like, oh, I just rolled four fours in a row. Right? Because that's not going to be rewarding to the players in any meaningful way. It's just going to be a little bit disheartening. Right? Yep. They're going to be like, oh, we couldn't do it, so you had to make it easier on us. Versus starting off with like... Uh, a thug and two mastiffs, four bandits, and uh, three steam methods. And then when the party wipes the floor with them, like, oh, a cult fanatic and four cultists showed up. Oh, a veteran showed up. Three magmen showed up. Adding on later, once you've already kind of like tuned into where the party is, um, because ultimately one of the biggest weaknesses, I think, in modules overall is the short-sightedness and combat adjustments right yes. because like a very strong party of level two char- uh, six level two p- characters doesn't have more survivability necessarily than it's three more level economy. four characters there's just more action economy and if all of those actions are i swing and miss and then the veteran hits me like it's not <laughs> you helpful, got two good hits right? and you're down like, you're yeah like, like you know it just doesn't work out so there are ways to adjust upward and mm-hmm. that can be seen. That's why I suggest, or why Brian suggested the uh, the. There are ways to adjust upwards. You know, the one thing that Brian said, adding an exhaustion check. Mm-hmm. There's ways to make things more difficult. And I would actually, some of the things I really like about tier one, uh, it's not combat, but the other things that are in there are, they make good use of elements. Elements that are happening yeah. that get lost in tier two, tier three, and tier four, where you have these tier one characters making these exhaustion checks, and you're like. I hate exhaustion, but right. it makes it more difficult and creates the environment. Well, I just and think, I think about, that's like, important. I just think about a scenario at tier one where like it's a combat outside and it's made twice as difficult because it's like raining, right? Like I can't it's shoot disadvantage him. on everything. I can't now. shoot him in the rain. Like, like that makes it twice it's as challenging at tier yeah. one versus like tier four where like it's raining i cast control like control weather whatever i i pull up my umbrella and yeah you know, it's, it's not like... raining anymore <laughs> whatever you know um and so like tier one tier one is really the place where you as a dm can like use all of the tools you have available to you to adjust these combat scenarios in ways that are meaningful right like it's very possible that the f- sm- that smoke could fill up the house and cause the whole house to be heavily obscured Right, like maybe everybody has disadvantage on attack rolls because there's so much smoke in this house that you can't see two feet away from you. Like it's a viable option. You have so many tools at your disposal that just like adding a veteran with 68 hit points and an AC of 17 is, it's like- You're really struggling to fill time. I feel like that's a fill time moment. Well, and And it's a situation where like, it's the least common denominator, right? It's the least creative way to make this a more interesting fight. 
if the combat was too easy, it feels like, you know, maybe, which I don't always advocate for, is, you know, make the, more, the next combat a little more tough. At the same or time, like, you got to be aware of resource set management because technically, right. after all is said and done, this was a, let's say they got it done in less than 10 rounds. This is a minute mm -hmm. of what was going on. The house fills with smoke in five minutes. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's, that's to the mods uh, statement. Mm -hmm. So realistically, they can find somewhere else, you know, to get a long rest. So yeah. they should be refreshed afterwards. So I don't want to rely on the, hey, this was difficult, but like you had so much stuff attacking you yeah. where if it was let's say five to level two characters this is actually gonna be super challenging hmm. um and then also like there's this misconception that every fight has to be hard like sometimes there's just easy fights like <laughs> you know what i mean so like, what i miss in tier two and tier three i want a band to come up and be like time to give me your money you're like no yeah like go no. away you're dead go away Leave me alone. yeah lightning yeah. bolt like sometimes there's easy fights and like it means shifting from progression from an xp focus to a narrative focus means that those easy fights are sometimes seen as as valuable as challenging fights yeah but like so what <laughs> like like ultimately, yeah i agree like if people were at the table enjoyed themselves had a good time um felt like they succeeded in their mission like what else is the goal of the time you spend at the table playing D D? I will actually even say further. We jumped into combat. My one of my favorite parts of this mod uh, is the house exploration. She's mm -hmm. got like three libraries, mm -hmm. and like what? And someone always goes like the wizard goes like, "What can I find?" And I always pick at something like, let's say they were they had their they told me their favorite dish from way back in the beginning of this mod, right. and it was sun dried tomatoes. And it and then they go, "I'm looking for something." I'm like, "What kind of books on the shelves?" And it says like, "Sun dried tomatoes and you right. like." Like you know, agricultural adding practices of heirloom <laughs> tomatoes and yes. the drying of the sun. Like, that whatever. to me, a like, thousand times more interesting mm -hmm. than this. So, like, let's say you had an easy combat. Cool. But you just had another guy find, like, bubble pipes mm -hmm. and how to make them. Yeah. Now cool. he's going to book our bubble pipes. And, like, yeah. Zork Hoken's like, yeah, take it. I haven't. I don't need bubble pipes. I don't, I don't need, need bubble pipes. I've got 10,000 yeah. of them. Like, I think the most interesting thing about this combat for me is not the combat necessarily, but we we keep going back to it and it's the mission, right? Like yeah. the goal here is not to like kill the bandits. The goal is to escape with Culkin, right? Yes. And I think it is easy for players who are combat minded to overlook the objective for their goal, right? Exactly. Like I want to kill the bandits. All right. Well, like this house is burning down and the, this noble, pol this no noteworthy politician is going to die right so we have to get her out of her room and get her out of the building haven't also spoken about not only that the patient yeah patient when everything's said and done is so Zol zora colkin's out cold mm -hmm. um you have the patient where you hear if you try to like listen in on the door um it's like you know when they first when dawson shows up he like barricades the door that's where these tracks are coming from but like Someone's gonna want to check that. Someone's gonna want to check Zara Culkin. Cor Culkin's like out like a like a lamp or out like a you know a bag of doorknobs, mm -hmm. and it, there's just a lot of other things. And I think bringing up the mission objectives is very important. Like your benefactor, your your benefactor is current. Yeah. The person who's gonna pay you is sleeping? about to die. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I feel like. We are on the same page about this. I don't yeah. know if there's much more to say. Sure. Um, I hope that if you're ever running, people understand, unless you're a hardcore DM and your players understand that you're a hardcore DM and you don't mention the thing about Zora, um, I don't think I've ever had a situation where she's died. Um, and I think tier one is not the place to be a hardcore DM. Yeah. Right. Um, like tier one is the place to kind of give, cut your character, you cut your players some slack and like sure. offer up suggestions and recommendations rather than like a tier three table or a tier four table where you're like, Oh, you didn't save her. That's on you. Yeah. I think that's, I, yeah, I agree. It's, I haven't had the situation where I've needed to use Perry on, but like he's there. If it happens, right. uh, he's there as a backup. I, I would almost be like table. You guys need to figure it out. <laughs> like Your benefactor died. Yeah. Um, like you, maybe, maybe you don't reward gold at that point. Like, yeah. 
as a DM, you're uh, responsible for like treasure at the end yeah. of the session. Like maybe if the benefactor dies, like nobody's there to pay you. Sorry, like it's all locked up in a bank. Or you get minimum gold. Yeah. Whatever it is, there's. I don't like doing that to players, but I also feel like I've run into a situation where people, whether experienced or not, they understand that there's value in keeping their employer alive. Yeah, and like the notion that actions have consequences and inaction has consequences. Yeah. But. Um, that's all I got for me. Yep. Part three, fire in the chapter house. Information and backgrounds. If your players did not capture an attacker, they're going to need to ask locals about leads and tips. Time dependent, you could also play up the depression and darkness of the Zent ghetto. It's a place of loss and neglect. If you're a well-to-do character, you might try to be prim and proper and earn yourself dirty looks. And if too much coin is flashed, an encounter. Seedier people will have much easier time to gather information. Let people utilize their backgrounds and ideas. No wrong answers here. Time to RP. Whatever the result of the RP, your players will be told about the Temple of Cyric. House of Lies. Description. There's no formal box text here, but you can use the first paragraph to set the scene. Everything minus the altar has been taken. Characters might ask about Cyric. He's the former Lord of Murder. A religion check of about a DC-10 should be enough to get that far at least. Altar. When your players go to search around the altar, describe the disturbance of the dust and footprints as well as the sliding altar evident on the raised platform or dais. A quick search finds a secret catch on the back of the marble altar. You could even describe the altar at this point as coated in black and maroon substance, dried blood. The altar will move quite easily after the catch is found, and once it's moved, it reveals the staircase leading under the temple. The Chapter House of Eternal Flame. For the remainder of the mod, this place is pitch black. You'll need to find a lighting situation in, in the hallway or the first room. Character choices. If your players have invested in their characters and have primordial or have a warlock invocation to allow them to read, you should reward that investment. The burning indoctrination. Character choices continued. Once everyone has entered the room, I like to give a moment to describe what is on the walls and specifically the Ignan, which is a dialect of primordial, which is used with language around the room and the repetition of words I'm imics and flames. Then box text and also combat. Combat? Uh, potential combat here with methods of different types. The entire shtick is about exploding or AoE. They're not going to last long, but note that when they, they will weaken your party's resource pool for the following fight. Author's intent versus rewarding player choices. There should be enough information to successfully navigate the summoning trap if players have spent their resources in the right places. The Cells. Description. There are several empty rooms with one exception. One of the rooms has a chest with a journal, consumables, and treasure. At the end of the hallway is a large iron door with chanting on the other side. Info dump. This spot is guilty of an information dump with your players by entering a bunch of information, names, and ideas that have not been mentioned up until this point. This is where the information from the adventure background can be of use for the DM. Ravia's journal details the destructive nature of the devastation orb timetables that fit the destruction of Elmwood and said experimental orb, switch to magical force recruiting the magical staff and its properties, and finally, a pet hawk referencing an asset on the secret police force. The Temple of Imix. Use the box text to initiate combat. Combat. You have a combat here with an Azur and cultists. At this point, you should have a feel for what your table is capable of and what resources they have left. The adjustments will change the amount of cultists or switch them to cult fanatics. One of the cultists is Ravia. Throughout the combat, you should try to accent her madness since she thinks she's unstoppable and describes in detail the destruction of Elmwood. So, Brian, how do you feel about this? I mean, all in all, with the mod itself, we're this far. I know there's a big part is the, the intent. Mm -hmm. Intent of the The intent of the author authors. versus the, the choices of the players. Yeah, so I'm of the mind that I will always prioritize player experience over author's intent, right? Um, ultimately, the author has already made their money when I bought this mod. Um, and frankly, like, I'm much more beholden to my players than their intentions, right? So the intent in this module, before we get to like the final combat, there's this notion of these methods, right? 
And based off the mod, there's not enough information listed in the module itself yep. to give the players an opportunity to bypass this trap that summons methods, right? And I understand like wanting to a check player resource or character resources, b introduce these no, new like exploding death mechanics, c introduce like elemental creatures in general, right? But ultimately where I would fall down on this is if you have a player who has invested their character's resources into being able to decipher the, the, the writing in the room, um, primordial in general, um, somehow have some indication of the clues, right? I would just let them skip this combat. I would reward them with that and let them go ahead and say, you know what, like, you have the resources. Um, and it's not necessarily knowing the language bypasses the trap, right? Correct, yeah. Like, there are, like, specific things, like, repetition of the words, uh, like, the specific words to bypass this trap. So they're going to have to piece those words together based off what they see. But mm -hmm. as a DM, I would put a little extra effort in here and come up with ways to provide clues for that solution. Yeah. That don't necessarily mandate combat. For And the things that come to mind is, like, if you have a Genasi, right? Like... Genasi don't get a ton else, right? Water Genasi are okay. They have some spells that are pretty useful, but like earth and air are kind of limited. They're kind of on the the, the short niche. end of that stick. Um, fire is a little bit better, but not awesome. Like if you've taken the language primordial, like I guess this season is where it will come up the most. Yeah. But ultimately like, you're really doing yourself a disservice taking primordial instead of elven dwarvish elven, any of Sylvan, yeah, any like any of them any one of those languages i agree um, and ultimately like language is not a thing that comes up very often in adventures league right like mm -hmm. i don't i can't think of many modules where they're like what languages do you speak it matters right but yeah. making it matter here is a way to like reward that character choice and kind of telegraph to your players like I'm looking for you to use your whole sheet, right? Yeah. Like I want you to use all of your character options, not just the ones that are about like hitting stuff in your spells. Yeah. I, it's, I agree with you. Um, if you, I don't like not being able to answer because it's a forced combat. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, strictly from the mod on cue, a low gravelly voice echoes throughout the chamber speaking common. Who watches the world burn? I mean, I don't want to yell into my mic, but it's supposed to be like, who watches the world burn? Yeah. Like, aggressive. There's no way that your players, even if they did made the adjustments, technically could ever answer the question. Mm. Ever. Yeah. I just think you say Imix, it's like, okay. And like, you don't say his full title. Okay. Yeah, and it's a situation where it's like a false setup, right? Because they set you up as like this way to unlock this door. Right, the module is set up in a way to telegraph to the players that like there is a solution here, right? And one of my biggest concerns is you'll have players who sit in this room for 35 minutes trying to solve what they think is a puzzle. It's not even a puzzle. A riddle, it's just... When like it's just not. There's no evidence there, right? That's outside um, game knowledge that you cannot yeah. use. And if somebody said that exact answer, I'd be like, well, looks like everything starts to flare up. <laughs> like... Yeah, and it's 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 frustrating because like. I'm we've we've talked before about like using outside knowledge as a player for yeah. puzzles like this, right? And not just rolling an intelligence check. Sure. But ultimately here, like if you speak specifically Ignan, but ultimately primordial Eve also, like maybe I would give an Arcana check if you speak Ignan, maybe an advantage to Arcana check to figure out who watches the world burn. Like that seems to be a title rather than a genuine question, right? So yeah. like maybe your character in their studies, if they're a wizard and an evocation wizard specifically, who Which knows- Which is still even a pull though. That's a, right. a major push on that, in yeah. that front because it, this is a cult. Yeah. You're level two. Yeah. <laughs> like. So I, ultimately like I would telegraph 
clues, uh, but maybe not necessarily the solution itself. Sure, I agree. Yeah. And then um, we get into um, the big combat, which... I well, before then, oh, yeah. we're not even... I, I do not like what they did with this with the journal Mm -hmm. um i think that's something that i mean you're gonna have five rooms you get past you get past this this other ignorant issue Mm -hmm. you get past these five rooms they have slight things in there very minimal the sixth room has got an info dump that if 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 your players are willing to look into it yeah and that kind of circles back into the very beginning adventure background gives color Mm-hmm. this entire scenario um i don't like how you they're just like the first time they mention a girl's name they um they're telling you about devastation orbs what are those mm-hmm. they're telling you uh about the staff that like it, it's like a sudden switch yeah and it's kind of just like it's a little tough to absorb right off the base because you're like normally when these adventures begin you get hit with like a K- like info dumps in the beginning and then you'll get like sp- spruces of answers there's little spritzes of answers every here and there yeah and a lot of times you have to seek those out right yeah. like there's a role play component there like the idea of like all of this being spilled out in a journal that you found in a chest in a room in a dungeon in a temple like next to chanting room yeah, yeah like it's just like it seems a little contrived and like a little convenient, frankly. Yeah. Um, that's not to say like, it's not pertinent information. That's not to say like a journal isn't a good way to pass on information of an adventure. Um, it just seems you're running at that point, I think too close to the time. Mm -hmm. And it's, I've been in cons where, you know, time is going and you gotta get to the next table or whatever it may be. And people start info. The DMs going like, "Well, wait a minute," blah 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 blah, blah. and then just like, you're like, "What just happened?" Yeah. And then you go to the next table, which might be the next one in the series, and yeah. you have no idea what happened. It just feels a poorly placed thing. I mean, I guess just since this is right before the main combat, this is like probably the best place they could have put it. Yeah, and if they had provided like a player handout here to like give your players this information, that would be awesome. That they could take with them, like that solves all of these problems. Yeah. Right. Like. Um, it's not an info dump that you have to take notes on while I shout at you rapidly. Here's yeah. a handout for you that you can take with you. This is the information you need to know about what you know about devastation orbs and what you know yeah. about the hawks and their pet on the hawks and what you know about um, their intent, right? Like those kinds of resources are valuable and frankly just kind of missing um and maybe this was no i don't think so i would i would try to excuse it as like they didn't weren't really thinking in terms of player handouts at this point but like there are plenty of player handouts in season one you know so obviously it's something that they had a frame of reference for and just chose not to do um so there's a lot of cool information here that it could have been remedied in a player handout um but that then comes down to dm prep are you making sure you give your yeah. your players player handouts and yeah. i mean convenient with modern day technology if they are friends of yours or mm-hmm. this is the first time they've ever played it even though this mod's been out for five years um you know they can send it through a group chat and be like oh i took a picture of it this is what it says yeah i'm i'm in the favor of having cool information about a shocker staff of charming uh, you know in terms of info wise i think that isn't like they're saying oh it's broken someone's will and it gives it gives details about a magic item that are that's you know you'd have to either wait to identify or something like that but it kind of gives cool like little clips to like what it can do mm-hmm. yeah. um i would love to have that be like oh this was a staff that was used to xyz this, this blah 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 like i don't know I get yeah and flavor. i think there's there's color to that right like so many of the magic items in al like are reflavored in interesting ways Yes. Um, and this is not an exception to that, right? Like, there's a lot of cool history here mm-hmm. um, that is valuable to players, right? Yep. Um, so I guess from there we go into the final encounter. Uh, it features your favorite piece of block text of all mm-hmm. time. Absolute um, favorite. It features a piece of block text that I really enjoy, but is probably... 
more graphic than I would have expected based off the rest of the block text in AL. Um, I I would there should I would have been be a aware of your age group when you, yeah. if you're going through this, right? Like there's some pretty gruesome stuff that gets discussed in the block text. So just kind of like keep an eye on that as well as like what like your age group is on your group. Um, yeah. Cause there's pretty like graphic descriptions here um, that I would hate to like. It's an extreme. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like the extreme. I mean, compared to uh, I think one dash seven tales trees tell, which was a very graphic description. And they put a disclaimer out there for it. Yeah. I mean, this borderlines that it's close to the point where you're just like, this is a little much, but at the same time, it builds the suspense it when does. an Azur is created yeah. in an unholy way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it actually, uh, in the mod itself, it gives a little background to how Azers are created. Um, this is, if an, a true Azur had seen how this process happens, where somebody jumps into a suit and gets forced in, mm -hmm. that's how an Azur is made. A true Azur would think he's an abomination. Yeah. And it's a weird piece of flavor that you would never really think about, but it's a cool, like, hey, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's weird because it's like a variant origin story for a race that's never come up in modules before, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like this variant Azur. Well, what's an Azur? Well, I don't know, but this is a variant. The dwarf it, on right? fire. Like, like it's, it's, it's very random. Yeah. And, like, and of course, this is actually a really cool place um, because you're getting introduced to Azurs, because now we're dealing with elemental evil. Yeah. And that, I believe, is multiple times in the next set of mods, mm -hmm. not necessarily the next mod, but we encounter Azers. And then yeah. they become more prevalent throughout mm -hmm. the series or the, uh, the seasons. And this is where you really get insight into the fact that these are not the elements, these are the corrupted elements. Yes. Yeah. Um, the other thing in this fight that I think is important, and if you are willing to go that extra step, is that Rabia is insane. Mm -hmm. um, really cool point is that she, in graphic detail, tells of what happens in Elmwood. Mm -hmm. Like, full disclosure, this is not how I feel about our orphanages, but like, she could say something along the lines of like, yeah, I blew up that orphanage, orphanage no problem. Yeah. Like, definitely feel out your age group right, but like and, if yeah. you have the extra moment to say during her turn because every turn six seconds mm -hmm. but be like aggressive with it make her seem like she's untouchable she is very much killable it's not an mm -hmm. issue but like but she doesn't think she is right and i think she doesn't think she is that's the intimidating thing to players is if like you deal damage and obviously you deal damage and she's like i don't i didn't feel that like yeah that is what makes the players have to make a choice whether they're going to keep going or cut and run while an Azur is fighting him yeah like it's definitely an interesting um mm -hmm. an interesting fight and uh i i enjoy that very much mm -hmm. conclusion if colkin is alive she's thankful for everything the party has done she's willing to sponsor any spellcaster into the cloaks this grants a story reward Pet Hawk. After about 15 minutes of speaking with Culkin, a man by the name of Sark Tolliver arrives with 15 members of the soldiery and demands Ravia's journal to be turned over. He says that it's he says that it's for an internal investigation within the Hawks about the cult. Culkin is visibly shook and says the party should immediately turn over the journal. It's later destroyed. Pillars of play. This mod does a very good job of hitting on every aspect of play, from having RP through the House of Suffering fighting in the estate and in the end exploring the estate in the zent ghetto it highlights different pillars you can expand on each separately as much or as little as you want adjust it according to your party it incorporates secondary goals and combat scenarios it allows player choice to avoid combat scenarios and it gives opportunity to plan out tactics before committing to a course of action Overall reviews, strengths, and weaknesses. For new players, it offers a good glimpse of the city of Molemaster without bogging them down too much. DM prep is important here for maximizing the experience. It hits all three pillars of play in varying amounts, and it feels pretty natural. 
As the first four hours of the Mole Master story arc, the multi-level, multi-area combat is an awesome add, but can be difficult to run for a newer DM. I see it as a great wow factor, but if unprepared, it could cause dead time at the table. All of this is detracted in the end with an information dump that can overwhelm players. Coherence and the larger impact on the story. Not a question, the story kicks off a great story arc, very easy to digest and expresses the dangers that can be found in the city of danger. There's so much content surrounding Molemaster that these events could have happened before or after the Red War and Thean involvement, providing a lot of versatility in the mod. Ultimately, there's a lot in City of Danger to point to as highlights. Combat encounters that don't depend on combat are a great way to focus your players on the goal. Several potential encounters offer a degree of replayability, and the seeds to an exciting arc that are fleshed out over the next 14 modules. So there it is, DDEX 2-2, Embers of Elmwood. Thank you so much for listening to some advice to streamline and run it for your tables. Be a good neighbor. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon. And from now until the next time, roll together.